Hello and welcome to episode 50 of Late Night Linux, recorded on the 12th of November 2018. I'm Joe and with me are Phelan. Good evening. And Graham. Hello. Yes, no Will this evening. He's got man flu by the sounds of things, so we gave him the night off. But never mind, we've got no GNOME or Ubuntu stuff anyway. So uh, <laughs> actually, there is one Ubuntu thing, so you're going to have to stand in for him, Graham. But uh, before we get to that, let's start with the news. Uh, there's been some Plasma updates uh, coming, some boring KDE shit. Go on, tell us, fail him. There is always KDE shit coming. It's every week. It's brilliant. Um, now, continues to grow, get better improve and um, there's a great blog it's come to its 44th week i think at this point guy nate from previously apple i believe and he got involved at kde and started doing you know low-hanging fruit paper cuts and he has released a great blog every week and he's detailing you know what's coming up in the next few releases all the all the hard work that's going in, uh, lots of things that you wouldn't even notice, like simple things like uh, button changes, uh, standardizing text on all the uh, actions that you can do. There's qu- quite a good few things in there. Um, and for four fifteen, which is coming out in early January, um, and there's a there's a fair few features that are I'm looking forward to anyway. Um, some of the applications that will be coming in eighteen twelve, maybe just a fraction. Sooner than that, a uh, major one I'm dying for is the console bell, which I'm sure you'll all be thrilled about, which is if one of the console terminals draws attention to you, it changes the damn icon on the tab. And you might think that that is not very exciting, but when you have about 20 servers with SSH open and then one of them has gone bing and you can hear it in your headset, you're like, what the fuck was that? So uh, yeah, uh, this this will be uh, a monumentous day when that happens, so. Um, but one of the main things I'm actually looking forward to is WireGuard is going to be in uh, 5.15. And that looks to be a very, very nice VPN because I just hate OpenVPN and IPsec is much the same. They're just horrible. Even with the scripts, those scripts that you can roll out, make it nice and easy, they're all fine and well until they break and then you have to know how it's all tied together. And yeah, no, WireGuard seems to be right in the button, especially when it's so small as well. Yeah. I've not had a chance to play with it, but this is this is the code that Linus was so impressed with, isn't isn't it? Yeah, that's right. There's so many great features. I like the way the K runners getting small incremental updates, like, like measurements used by the petroleum industry. Yeah, that was, is <laughs> absolutely hilarious. It's like, is uh, what, what's the joint French one? To- total, I think it's total. Yeah. Maybe somebody in Total sponsored that one or something like that. I don't yeah. know. Or maybe we'll see Shell switch to KD at some point. I reckon even we could add a few of our own to that. It can't be difficult, can it? Well, this, that's one of the things I want to highlight is if you look at the link that we're going to link to on, on Nate's blog, there's a uh, there's a fabricator page for that very feature. And um, there's a guy comes in, says, I'd love to actually do that myself. Yeah. Um, Jao Neto, I think his name is. Um, so he steps in and says, yeah, I'd like to get involved in that. And Nate... And um, Caillou of Brolic both help him out, give him a whole lot of pointers and say, here, here you go, because it's a relatively handy fix to do. And uh, yeah, I think it's quite a good example of how you can get involved quite easily, even if you're not quite sure how KDE works, have a bit of C++. It's, it's a great example of how to get involved. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I like to joke about, uh, you know, KDE boring bollocks or whatever, but it is, I think, in terms of desktop Linux, where all the good innovation seems to be happening, especially with things like KDE Connect, which had an update recently. Yeah, for a bug that it apparently had that I didn't even notice. It shows how much I browse my phone on it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it's even got support for Thuna now, which rolls. So that's, uh, You're sort of good. <laughs> yeah. Well, Plasma Mobile, we might possibly see one day on the Librem 5, but um, that looks like it's been delayed again because now the dev boards have slipped yet again. Now they might ship in December when they were supposed to be in the summer. So hmm, that's not good, is it? No, I don't think we're surprised. <laughs> um, but when, when surely when something's this close um, to actually people getting their hands on the hardware, I, I mean, for, having followed other similar campaigns, that usually means there is something tangible in it will end up all right i'm hoping i I backed the keyboardio for like two and a half years 
Um, and that was always similarly close to getting hands on hardware, but it didn't happen for a long, long time. Yeah. Well, I've got a bet going with Wimpress. He says that they're not going to ship the final phone in 2019 at all. They'd originally aimed for January 2019. Now it's looking like, well, that's definitely not going to happen, but whether or not it's going to be in 2019, I'm convinced that it will. I think probably autumn 2019 is my prediction. But yeah, he, he reckons that I'm going to definitely own my pint. He linked me to this article, which I'd already read anyway, but he said, look, see, see, it's not happening. Mm. <laughs> because he understands how much development goes into it. And, you know, they are working with hardware that they don't really have yet, or, you know, they didn't have f until quite late on because they'd originally targeted the IMX6 CPU, but then they wanted to upgrade to the 8, which is much more powerful. And they're struggling with the drivers and everything. And, you know, they've validated certain aspects of it, but there's still a lot to do by the sounds of things. And even getting these dev boards out is a tricky thing. But to get the actual finished phone out is something else, isn't it? Because, you know, you, the dev boards can be pretty rough, can't they? They don't necessarily have to fit in cases and stuff like that. Whereas the phone has got to be a finished consumer product. And, I desperately want this to be amazing. And I think I said at Foss Talk Live that I think the, um, well, the chances are it's not going to be very good, but um, I really, really want it to be. And seeing these slips, I mean, to be fair, they have been fairly transparent with it. They, they're pretty good with the updates, aren't they? And they did have a like a fairly decent excuse, like it was only a hurricane and stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can't control the weather yet. You can't, but you can plan for it, can't you? How? <laughs> well, by if you think that it's going to be early 2019, if you say it's going to be late 2019, then... You're into hurricane season again. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! Yeah, but if, if you say it's going to be several months after what you think it, it's going to be, and then it slips, then it's not a problem. And if you then deliver it months before you said you were going to, everyone's going to be over the moon, aren't they? So it's win-win. Yeah, all right, Scotty. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. I, I want them to succeed. I dearly want them to succeed. In fact, the more time goes on, the more I want it to succeed. <laughs> yeah, the more the more I look at my lineage phone, yeah, the more I want something that's going to be easy to update. <laughs> more of that later. <laughs> yeah. Well, we could uh, switch them around. Let's do cover that now then. So lineage are changing the update frequency. So if you are lucky like ours that are on 15.1, then you're going to be getting dailies because it was weeklies before, wasn't it? I mean, they called it nightlies. Yeah, yeah. If you're on fifteen dot one, okay. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure you are. I, I'm certainly. <laughs> oh yeah. Now, because you're too lazy to update the firmware or something. Yeah. I so I'm stuck back in. Oh, I'm not even going to say it's embarrassing at this point. It's just one of those things where it's a work critical device. Yeah. And I just know if I update it, I'll forget a bunch of stuff. I'll have not backed something up and I'll have trashed all the, the settings on it. And I'll be like, every time I look at it, I go, oh man, this is a few hours of work. Do I really want to do this now? It's like, no. So yeah, I just want, I just want that to go away. It shouldn't be like you, upgrading a PC, bang, done. I mean, the KD Neon upgrade, putting it off for ages, not a problem. It was fantastic. I just know yeah. even a minor update on this phone is going to trash it. Because the last time I did it, it just wiped everything and I lost all the settings, all the apps. I was like, oh, cool. Fresh restart. Yay. Uh, that's because you don't flash the Google apps. They keep it safe. Uh -huh, that's my yeah, advice. Yeah. That's what they do. <laughs> <laughs> but if you are stuck on 14.1 like you seem to be or like my wife's Nexus 5, then you're only going to be getting monthlies now. Look, that that's even too much change for me at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I think weekly was good cadence, really. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not I'm not going to do it every day now, so I don't know. Like, Because they used to have the nightlies, didn't they, every day yeah, when it was back right. when it was Cyanogen Mod. And then once a week, no, was it once a month, they would have like what they considered a stable one, a snapshot. And so I would just always yeah. stick on that update um, trajectory, and that always worked out fine for me. And these weekly ones, touch wood, have all been absolutely fine. So now it's onto dailies. Now it's sort of like whenever I can be asked to update it, I suppose I'll just do it. Or whenever I hear about a vulnerability or something. You're just going to get Gen 2 itis, though. You're going to be itching because you know there's a new version and you don't have it and you have to upgrade. Yeah, I think you mean arch itis. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Sorry, I'm living in the past. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Anyone out there listening to this, if you genuinely use Gen2, then do get in touch with us, latenightlinux.com slash contact. Uh, don't tell us if you use Arch. You probably already have told us if you use Arch. But um, <laughs> yeah. I, I use Arch. Oh, do you? <laughs> Thanks, oh, Graham. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like, I wonder, is there anyone out there seriously using Gen2? And I don't mean Chrome OS. I mean proper Gen2 as their like standard desktop machine. Uh, or laptop or whatever, do let us know because I'd be interested in that. Well, funny point to note, in that Librem 5 article, there's a link to KiCad, as it's apparently pronounced, which... Really? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that, on that page, I went to the downloads because I wanted to know what it was written in because I thought, God, there seems to be an awful lot of OSs here. I thought, is this a horrible Electron app? And no, it's not. It's a C++ and it uses WX widgets and there is a link to the Gen 2 version. So somebody's using it. Oh, wow. So I don't think much is going to change, really, with this lineage update situation. I, I don't know, is a month too long to wait? If you get your monthly update and then there's a vulnerability comes out, then you're going to be waiting nearly a month to get it. Um, that kind of sucks. I guess, though, they might they might rush it, though, if there is a severe one. Maybe, yeah. And, you know, Maybe. it does seem to be the almost the standard for the big OSs like Windows and the like where they do monthly releases. So, um, yeah, not that that's an excuse, but I mean, the bad thing about Linux is the fact that you get updates when they're out and ready. It's also the good thing about Linux, but it just means that you're sitting there going, okay, I have to consciously decide now I'm not going to patch that till the patch window, or do you make an exception of it? And that can be slightly annoying in a good way. Yeah, but as for monthly updates, most Android users would be glad with that, wouldn't they? Because mm-hmm. it's, you know, most, if you get a Samsung, maybe the flagships might get monthlies if you're lucky. But certainly older and cheap phones, you're just stuck on some ancient version of Android, no security updates for all these like Blueborn and whatever, you know, the big security vulnerabilities that get a website and a logo and all that. So monthly is probably enough for them. And it is the older version as well. So at least I'm getting my dailies now, my nightlies again, which will be good. Um, All right, so Samsung uh, Linux on decks, they call it. And we're not talking about uh, fresh. We're talking about DEX, which was there. Originally, this was going to be like a hardware uh, interface that you sort of plugged your phone into. Whereas now it seems that all you need is an HDMI cable, really, to, to use it on a couple of Samsung devices, the Note 9 and the Galaxy Tab S4. And it's just Ubuntu running in a container and everything you'd expect with that, like proper convergence. That sounds good. Someone should uh, try that and it definitely won't fail or anything, will it? <laughs> I hear that they're in the canonical offices... Uh, they were able to try this out last week, so I was very much looking forward to speaking to Will about it, but unfortunately he's off sick. I don't suppose uh, you're probably too lowly, aren't you, Graham, to have been shown this? I am, although maybe ironically I was in the office with Will last week, but I didn't see Dex running. Oh, right. Which is is a real pity, um, because... Secret meeting with the sign, no Grahams on the outside. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that is actually how it works. (laughs) But I never used to, I find myself like with the recent kind of clamshell computers that I don't quite want to get on the bandwagon for. I do think it would be useful to have something that I could use like this if I'm traveling and I need to type something, which does actually happen sometimes. The video, it looks really good. I mean, I don't know how realistic that video is. You know, there could be a bit of trickery going on. But I mean, if you say they tested it last week, then maybe it was the real thing. And it looks pretty damn slick the way you just plug it in. And you've got an actual usable mm. OS environment. like That's nice. Well, doesn't it appeal to you as a sysadmin, Phelim, to be able to, you know, as a last resort, pull if your battery dies on your laptop or whatever, to be able to just plug that into a screen somewhere and just have it's something that's got all your SSH keys on it and everything and, you know, be able to do your job, albeit not as well as with a proper laptop or whatever? Well, in theory, yeah, I mean, it'd be pretty good. I just, I'm just envisioning, though, trying to pull the dongle out, which has now wrapped itself around the... 25 meter network cable you carry because you couldn't find the short one and yeah. you've now forgotten the power lead for that adapter bit and i'm just being facetious there um it does look pretty cool and to be honest 
what you could do with that, you wouldn't need a laptop anymore because your battery and your phone's going to give you an awful lot more power. Now, I don't know if it, maybe it draws more when you do that, but even still, pretty damn handy. And an awful lot nicer than using a stupid fucking touchscreen. Fucking mm. hate touchscreens. Do you have any of these in your bag of tricks? No, unfortunately not. Uh, the the Galaxy Tab S4, now that looks very attractive to me because you don't need to plug that into anything. Because it's got a big enough screen, they deem it. You just have your wireless keyboard and mouse or whatever, and then it's just on the screen of the actual device itself. That sounds awful. That sounds like a Microsoft thing with a shittier keyboard that's strapped to the front of it. Yeah, but what I'm talking about is a last resort here. Okay. It's, you know, when you're traveling, when you're, hmm. I don't know, stuck in an airport or whatever, and your laptop battery's dead, or, you know, not something you're going to be using all the time, but if you've got this tablet for just watching films on or whatever um, while you're traveling, but you can also have this last resort of hook up a little keyboard to it and do that little thing that you need to do. Yeah. I, I mean, I take my laptop everywhere. Um, even for you know weekends away where I'm really not planning to do any work or anything, but it would be nice to have something that I know I could fall back on if I had to, that yeah. wasn't a laptop and its power adapter and all of that kind of stuff, worrying about it all the time. If it was something that was already with me, it'd be great. Yeah, it'd be nice to see some other stuff apart from Ubuntu because this is just Ubuntu 16.04. Apparently they're working on 18.04 as well, but... It would be nice if it was also on other devices. I'm really hoping that the hacker community are going to kind of make more of this, but I just fear that Samsung are going to lock it down too much, and maybe we won't actually see that. But fingers crossed on it, because it does look cool. I'd love to check it out, but the devices, the Note 9 and the, the Tab S4, are both like premium devices, so I'm not shelling out loads of money for them. I don't think there's lineage available for them either. I've kind of been on the lookout for a tablet, because my Nexus 7 and my Nexus 9 are a bit long in the tooth now, but there's not that many good Android tablets that aren't ridiculously expensive, so I don't know what to get, really. Uh, I wouldn't mind something like 8 or 9 inches, maybe, um, but it's got to have mainstream, you know, like official lineage support on it. So, yeah, if anyone knows of anything that isn't stupidly expensive and could be picked up on eBay or whatever for a reasonable price, then do let me know. Um, otherwise, I might have to uh, borrow someone's iPad that they're not using and go to the dark side. Boo. I think I might do that anyway just to see what it's like. But, uh, Audio latency is amazing on the iPad. Yeah, there's that open source synth available, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, that you checked out or did no you didn't check it out did you no i couldn't because i i have got an ink i've got the very first retina ipad so that's really old now um, right it hasn't been updated by apple for a long time and it didn't run on that yeah oh, that's a shame um all right uh moving on then reproducible builds gets a three hundred thousand dollar donation from those dodgy <clears throat> no not dodgy at all um cryptocurrency blockchain people <laughs> Scientologist. Uh, and also, <laughs> <laughs> no, not quite. And also joins uh, the Software Freedom Conservancy. Uh, what are they called again? The uh, the people who donated the money. Oh yeah, the handshake. Handshake. Foundation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Did they have a handshake just before they made the deal? <laughs> <laughs> well, so far all they've done is good stuff, like give money to free software projects. So maybe I shouldn't diss them just because the money's coming from blockchain uh, bollocks, but. The Reproducible Builds project used to be part of Debian. It's kind of been spun off from Debian now. Um, of course, reproducibility is being able to take source code and make binaries that are exactly the same no matter who is compiling the code into it. Because at the moment, if you are doing timestamps or stuff like that on your binaries, then the the binary that's in the repo isn't going to be the same as something I can compile on my local box. And that then raises questions about, well, is that binary actually coming from that source code? And so it's good if software can be made to be reproducible, which is a very difficult thing to do, it seems. So it's good that they're getting some money to make it more than just Debian and kind of spread out to other distros. And it would be good if eventually all free software was reproducible. Yeah, I thought it was quite funny that Conservancy's reason for having it was the fact that there wouldn't be hidden licensed um, source yeah. in there or you know yeah. uh, binary blobs or whatever it wasn't the actual tinfoil hat wearing sort of reason which I would probably have gone for but no that was actually their reason was that if they get given a piece of code they know that's all the code that's required which is yeah I guess smart enough alright but um, 
if you look at the reproducibility project, there's an awful lot more projects in there than you would have actually started out with because it was just Debian, as I said, but now it's Core Boot, OpenSUSE, OpenWRT, Tails, um, a few other ones too, something about Berkeley Source, I don't know what they are, um, <laughs> Arch and Tor. Uh, so, I mean, you know, all important things. You you want to know that that code is what it says in the tin. So it's pretty good. Yes, especially stuff like uh, Tor and Tails. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, that licensing thing I'd never thought of before. Is that just them, like, uh, you know, if, if all you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail sort of thing, and they're just obsessed with licensing and not being sued or being sued or whatever. So that's just the, the angle they take on it. But I'd, I'd, that's, I'd never heard that before. But it is a good point, isn't it? Like, if there's software in there, someone snuck a bit of, um, you know, proprietary code in there, then you could end up getting sued for deploying it or whatever. Yeah. And there's there's quite a quite a good few names who are going to be on that steering committee as well as uh, Bedell Garby, the Australian with the most crazy shirts in the world. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. Always watch Linux Conf AU. You'll never be disappointed about the shirt he's wearing. Yeah. What, what do we think of Conservancy then? I mean, I've sort of jokingly said that they're a bit litigious, but it seems like a fairly good fit, doesn't it? Yeah, I think so. I I, I quite like them. I quite like the people involved. I know you, you don't really like Bradley Coon, but I was really impressed when I met him. And uh, Karen Sandler's awesome. Well, I've never met him, so that's not. it's not fair to say I don't like him, but um, I don't know. He's, he's a bit of a zealot, isn't he? He's a bit of a Stallman type. Um, yeah. He could do with being a bit more pragmatic, I think, but it's, it's not fair to say I don't like him because I'm, I'm sure if I met him, he'd be a lovely fellow to have a point with and to talk about free software. Yeah. I think... Having spoken to Bradley a few times, it's it's they can, people like Bradley come from a point where of almost complete exasperation with the situation where they've tried to be pragmatic before, or they've they've seen other people trying to do the right thing, and in the end they kind of end up being the devil's advocate. I sometimes think of conservancy being the devil's advocate. It's like we shouldn't have to be this litigious or looking in such fine detail, but the situation forces us to be and certain companies force us to be. So I think in that way, they kind of do good work. Yeah, I think you've got to have someone pulling on that end of things, haven't you, to make sure that these companies are kept in check and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not exactly easy to compete when you have the likes of a legal department from, you know, a Fortune 500, and they've decided that they're going to sue you because the firmware company who built their TV firmware actually used your code, but they think that you stole it off their TV. And... uh many things like that so yeah i think you, you you might get somewhat more cantankerous in that type of environment all right well let's end the news with uh two of the most important free and open source software projects and that is react os which has uh, got a 0.4.10 release and one of the headline features is it can now boot from a butterfs volume <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we need to be the preeminent React OS podcast at this point. And um, I'd just like to point out that if it boots off ButterFS, it now officially probably has a better OS, uh, sorry, a better file system than Windows itself does. <laughs> just about. Because how long have they tried to build WinFS or whatever the hell it's called and yeah. never managed? And there you go, bang, they've done it. They've won. Look, there's nothing wrong with NTFS. It's a great file system. It's not as bad as it was, but it's still pretty shit. <laughs> it's better than bloody fat, isn't it? Is it? <laughs> Probably not, no. Not if you want to access it from Linux. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they've also got some front-end improvements and um, just general refinement, really. I was meaning to try this, but I just ran out of time today. But... Um, it's it's good fun, isn't it, React OS? It's like a blast from the past. And it does seem to have accelerated recently, doesn't it? The development on it. There didn't seem to be any news for ages about it, but now they say they're going for a quarterly release cycle. And yeah, I suppose maybe I'm just getting old and that seems like <laughs> frequent to me now, one, you know, four four times a year. But it's certainly more than it used to be. So it's it's a bit of an oddity, isn't it, in the whole Linux and open, well, open source world. It's not Linux, of course. So it's it's good that we've got it. It's always good fun, I reckon. I think a challenge for, for next show, you have to actually run something that you use on it. We have to record a podcast in it. Oh, yeah, oh, totally. Like <laughs> Sound recorder. Well, this Audacity for Windows, we could try and install that on it and 
I don't know about getting uh, the audio drivers going. Ash, it'll be grand. Don't worry about it. <laughs> well, I'm going to try and record a Joe Ress or something on it. That'd be hilarious. Shortest episode ever. <laughs> yeah, just a load of like static and crackling or something. Yeah. Okay, this episode is sponsored by DigitalOcean. Go to do.co slash LNL. That's for late night Linux. And that will give you $100 credit to get started and 60 days to use it. Now, DigitalOcean offers VMs, or droplets as they call them, in data centers all around the world with super fast network and super fast SSDs. And they offer various distros, Ubuntu, Fedora, Debian, CentOS, even FreeBSD, and some container distros, CoreOS, Fedora Atomic, and Raja OS. But you can also use your own custom distribution if you don't want to use one of those. And these droplets start at $5 a month for a gigabyte of RAM, one CPU, 25 gigabytes of disk, and a terabyte of transfer. And they go all the way up to 32 CPUs with 192 gigabytes of RAM and ridiculous amounts of storage. But they also have CPU-optimized droplets. So if you only need a lot of CPU and you don't need that much RAM or disk, you can go for one of those. And if you want to add storage to any of these droplets, it's really easy with either object storage or block storage. You just attach however much you want to your droplet and start using it. And you can either start with a basic distro install and build it up to be exactly what you want, or if you want a quick shortcut, they've got loads of one-click apps like Basic Lamp and Lamp Stacks, WordPress, Discourse, GitLab. So go to do.co slash LNL, get your $100 credit, and start creating VMs with full root access all around the world. That's do.co slash LNL. On to a bit of admin then, and first of all, thank you everyone for supporting us on PayPal and Patreon, it's very much appreciated. Patreon has ticked up a little bit since I moaned last time, I think. But yeah, do remember that for $5 a month you can get the ad-free feed, and mostly I won't fuck it up and put the uh, ad-free version of the episode in the in everyone's feed, so that uh, <laughs> if you're paying less than $5, I did that, and then about, I don't know, 18 hours later, I realized. So people probably got that, which was a uh, nice freebie for you. But yeah, I'll make sure I don't fuck that up tonight after I'm knackered. So yeah, go to latenightlinux.com slash support, and you can find a link to that um, Patreon and stuff, and the PayPal and Bitcoin, which I haven't checked for ages. I need to check that, because there's probably like a million quid in there. Sorry, I mean uh, five quid. Sorry, I mean two, <laughs> two million quid. Sorry, I mean 10 quid. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha. Now, actually, Bitcoin has been relatively stable. It's been at about six and a half thousand ish dollars for months now. So it's not quite your, what, a hundred grand guess that you thought it might be this year? Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I have to deal with that in a few oh, months. Oh, sorry. It might you, go you've got 30 days to fucking resurrect that one or 50 days, whatever it is, till the end of the year. Yeah. You never know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm not looking forward to recording that with Chris. It's going to be very embarrassing. But uh, there we go, because he'd said it was like more than 100 or something, but you never know. Um, yeah, so if you want to get in contact, latenightlinux.com slash contact as well. Okay, this episode is sponsored by Entroware. Go to entroware.com, and they are a dedicated Linux computer seller based here in the UK, and they sell computers with Ubuntu and Ubuntu Mate 1804 and 1810. And they've got a huge range of laptops from Intel only all the way up to real powerhouses with the latest NVIDIA graphics in them. And they've got a range of desktops, including a very nice looking all-in-one and even a couple of servers. Almost everything's configurable in terms of the CPUs, the RAM and the storage. Now, you're bound to find something to suit your needs and your budget. But if you want to tweak a few little things here or there, or you've got any questions, then do get in touch with them. They are really easy to talk to get back to you really quickly. And I've always had great experiences communicating with Entroware. They ship to the UK, Republic of Ireland, France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. And if you do buy one of the machines, then there's an option at checkout, a little drop down, select late night Linux, and they'll know that we sent you there. So go to entroware.com for all your Linux computing needs. Right, so I teased this last episode, and sure enough, it arrived. I've now got a Pine book, which is made by a company called Pine64 who originally made sort of Raspberry Pi type devices, but then branched out into these Pine books, which is a laptop with one of their single board computers inside it and a battery and not much else, which I found out when I opened it. 
And the deal with this is you have to sign up to a waiting list. And then when they've got enough people interested, they charge everyone the money for it and then put the order together and then ship them out. So it takes quite a while to actually get one. So they're a little bit sought after as a result. And it's advertised at $99. Well, to get it to the UK, by the time I paid for shipping, which to be fair was very fast, once it was dispatched, it only took a couple of days to get here, which I think is the quickest anything's ever come from the Far East to me. So thumbs up on that one. I think it was DHL. But yeah, all in all, it cost me about 140-ish quid, which is still very cheap for a laptop, but don't get your hopes up too much about it. So um, yeah, questions then. What do you want to know about this thing? What's the battery life like? Uh, the battery life is reasonably good. It depends on the screen brightness is the bottom line. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention this thing ships with KDE Neon. So it's brilliant then, essentially. Yeah, it's amazing, yeah. But, yeah, the battery life, that's what everyone assumes. Well, the thing is, it, I posted a picture on Twitter of the insides of it. It's got quite a large battery, but they could have fit much bigger battery in there. But obviously that would have made it more expensive and... Yeah, you've got regulations about how big batteries can be and stuff like that. So somewhere to put your cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you could probably smuggle all sorts in this. Actually, I'm sure that um, the authorities will be wise to that. But um, yeah, don't do that. Definitely don't do that. But yeah, battery life wise, it's hard to say. Really, I've not done any proper tests because I've only had this for a few days and I've been really busy. But um, you're looking at many hours put it that way mm. um if you have it on full brightness not as many hours but like at least as good as you know a high-end laptop that's got a you know some people talk about like 10 and 12 hour batteries and stuff and i don't know it might be approaching that i suppose but i was kind of hoping for more like three days battery with it because it's such a low power device but i think that the screen is really what takes up a lot of that battery, unfortunately. And what resolution is it? Some sort of horrible 1440 by 600 or something weird like that? Well, the device that I paid for had a uh, 720p, basically. What is it, like 1280 by 768? But then when I turned it on, I was like, that looks very sharp. And oh, hang on, there's a letter in here. Surprise, surprise, you've actually got a 1920 mm. by 1080. And so the screen is by far the best thing about it. It is nice. It's lovely. It's crisp. It's really bright. You never have to have it on full brightness. I'm a person who always has full brightness on most devices. But this, unless you're like in a super bright office or outside, I don't think you need to. And the viewing angles are amazing as well. It's a, It looks like a high-end panel, basically, that they've managed to put in this thing. 11.6 um, inch as well. So that is by far the best thing about it and i'm afraid it's a bit downhill from here uh oh um, so the keyboard is great then <laughs> the keyboard is all right it's a little bit it's like chiclet style it's a little bit mushy plastic or rubber keys plastic it's, it's not a zx spectrum then <laughs> no it's not that bad is it plastic caps on top of a zx spectrum <laughs> <laughs> maybe yeah. excel it's, it's, it's american layout as well uh, uh, i don't think there was an option take it back for, <laughs> My, my other Vivo book is American as well, so I'm just used to it. Um, I just set it to be English and just, um, or, you know, UK or whatever, and just the instead of shift two being the at, it's like shift next to the enter or whatever. <sighs> but, uh, yeah, keyboard-wise, it's all right. I find myself missing a few uh, letters here and there when I'm typing quickly on it. Okay. Uh, you wouldn't want to write a novel on it, put it that way, but um, a bit of SSH or something, you'd be all right. I reckon. Um, oh, yeah, battery-wise, um, the battery does last many, many hours, but it also takes many, many hours to charge it. Right. Like, I put it on charge. It got down to 1%. I was like, oh, shit, plugged it in. And then about 20 minutes later, I thought, oh, I wonder if it's nearly charged now. No, it was at, like, 3% or something. So I had to just charge it overnight. So I don't know how long that takes. But it has got a handy light next to the barrel connector. Oh, um, it's not USB-C, then? <laughs> no, unfortunately not. It's a uh, five volt, three amp, I think. So in theory, you could probably hack together a phone charger to charge it. Um, but it is like a little barrel connector. Okay. But build quality wise, it's plastic, but it's good quality plastic. It doesn't flex and stuff much. I mean, obviously a bit, but it doesn't feel like a piece of shit. It feels like a pretty well made chassis. Is there much to break in it by the screen? The screen? No. Nothing. There are no moving parts in it at all. So what you're saying is fill it with expanded foam. Okay. Yeah, 
pretty much. Um, yeah, there's no fan on it, so it's absolutely silent. That's another big plus. Speakers are absolutely shit, just devastatingly shit, like painful to the ear. Although, plug in headphones, and that's like crisp and nice and loud, the complete opposite of the Raspberry Pi, where if you plug in normal headphones, it just sounds fucking awful, doesn't it? I don't know if you've ever tried that. I've never tried that, I must say. Yeah, it is It is a known problem with it. Yeah, yeah. it's. I don't know if the audio circuitry or whatever's shit, but yeah, this... Sounds crisp and good. I didn't do any major tests, but just played a bit of music on it. sounded fine. So hardware-wise, it's all right, really. Um, it's just the software. It's not very good, unfortunately. How responsive is it? Do you know that you're using an ARM CPU? Oh, yes. Yes. Very much so, yeah. I mean, it's akin to a Raspberry Pi experience. It's better right. than a Raspberry Pi 3, uh, but it's not much better than it. You know, that extra gigabyte of RAM does help, but not that much. And it, the CPU is a little bit faster, I think, but it's still... This is this is tainted, I'm afraid, having just built a really beefy um, ninth generation i5 desktop machine with a really fast NVMe drive and 32 gigs of RAM. Anything else is just going to be shit compared to it. So, you know, that that has definitely colored my experience here, but... You know, for 140 quid with a screen that good, you can't really expect too much in terms of performance. But um, the thing about that screen is, though, that because they upgraded it, it's basically (laughs) fucked all of the ROMs that were available for it. I say ROMs, you know, like OS images, because they were like a couple of Android ROMs and like various other Linux distros. But on the day that I got it, there was only two available. There was KDE Neon, which is what it comes with by default, and then AOSC, which seems to be Ubuntu or Debian-based. I don't know. I only tried that briefly. Um, Now there's Q4 OS um, and various other stuff is appearing. But because they changed the screen resolution, that made it so that I think because it's ARM-based or something, it means that a lot of those images didn't work and they have to be updated for it, which kind of sucks a little bit, really. Uh, But, you know, that will get better over time, I think. It already has. It's not clear on the website whether you will always now get that 1080p screen or it will, was that simply circumstances? I, I guess you don't know, but I'd really want that screen now that I know some people have got it. Yeah, I don't know. They, that's the thing. Their communication isn't great generally. Mm. So, you know, I had to open a ticket to see where the fuck this thing was because I bought it months ago. Um and then they they said to me, oh, it'll be next week, and then that didn't happen. And then I got an email saying it'd be at the end of the month, and then it turned up um, early November. So, Do they charge you when you order? Yes. Yeah. So that money was resting in their account for quite some time. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I was sceptical that I was going to even get this thing, but I got it in the end. Um, oh, yeah, also the charger is a Euro plug on it. So uh, you can either use an adapter or, pro tip, the pins on a Euro plug are the same width as a UK or Irish. I think, yeah, you have the same plugs and sockets as us, don't you? We do. We do. Yeah. So what you do is you get um, the earth pin of another plug and open up the, <laughs> or a screwdriver and open up the things and then you can jam it in and then jobs are good and so you don't need an adapter. Joe's Handy Electrical Tips brought to you by Charcoal Hands. Yeah. Brought to you by the London Fire Brigade. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I probably don't do that. I probably shouldn't have said that, but that's what I did anyway. Just get a snip, cut the damn plug off and put a proper plug on it. Uh, well, you can't because it's like a transformer, isn't it? So uh, I'm sure it has a lead at one end, though, no? Oh, it's like a wall wart type thing. Yes. Uh, yes, that's the word. Yeah, yeah. It's reason to move to the EU. It, it is, really. I was wondering how long that would take. Um, right, so otherwise, hardware-wise on this thing, uh, it's got two USB... Uh, a ports which I presume they can't be USB 3 they're not blue so they must be USB 2 uh, headphone jack as I mentioned micro SD card reader which is really nice actually you click it in and then it's completely flush with the body of it and given that this thing's only got 16 gigabytes of MMC on board you are going to need an SD card if you want to store anything on it Yeah. so it's good that it sits totally flush although if you're a bit of a ham-fisted oaf like me, you're going to struggle to get it in and out 
because it's the, quite tight. So I use either a Plectrum or another SD card to get it in and out, to kind of click it in and out. So that's my tip there. Well, you said there's a lot of space inside. Surely you can just sell a tape load inside. <laughs> yeah, <and> fine. <laughs> probably could do. Joining them together with all that wire from your plug that you're going yeah. to be using. Now, another thing that I have to mention about KDE Neon is that it has a 3.10 kernel, which once upon a time was an LTS, but not anymore. It's uh, well dead. So I did ask Jonathan Riddle whether there was going to be any security updates for that, and he said he'd have to check, uh, but he hasn't got back to me yet, so I might have to update you next time on that. But yeah, that's kind of a bit shit, really. Yeah, yikes. Um, although the other image that I tried... The AOSC, which has got a Mate desktop, that has got a modern 4 dot something, 12, 13, something like that. So uh, that's much better, actually. And, that, and I only tested that booted off the SD card, and that worked really well, actually, probably better than KDE Neon, which is the thing that fucking oh, came with it. So, I don't believe that. No, I'm not talking about my personal preferences here, right? Because I do like uh, Plasma desktop. It is good. I'm talking about like for example randomly today when i booted it things would just windows would just disappear um and then you kind of move the mouse around and then they get redrawn and then disappear again some weird fucking bugs like that sounds a bit like graphics driver or something weird yeah and there's no hardware acceleration yet for it it seems so like video playback is just a complete non-starter do you know if there is in the more modern kernel that you saw uh it didn't look like it no right, okay it did seem better graphics performance. Like I could actually play videos rather than just having a weird, like fucked up lines and shit. But it wasn't. It was still really jittery, even for like standard def stuff. Oh, so sure, don't worry about that. There's always the MPV ASCII art image driver. You'd be grand. Yeah, yeah, that does look pretty cool. You can do that in VLC as well. So yeah, my big question for this is, what is it good for? Like, not really anything really apart from hacking well okay so we had the samsung dex right yeah that is a dongle that you plug into your phone but you need to have a screen generally unless you have one of those ridiculously expensive tablets yeah so this sounds perfect for that because you could literally fling that in a bag and go ah i don't care it's you know a cheap device i'm not gonna overly panic about it get a little neoprene sleeve for it and then throw it in a backpack job's done well, yeah, if all you wanted was a terminal, then, yeah, it would be good enough. I mean, the, the wireless on it, it didn't see my 5 gigahertz network, so you're not going to have any particularly fast speeds, but you don't need that for SSH, do you? All you need is to get to the access point at 2.4 gigahertz, and away you go. So I could see it for that, maybe. Um, I could say, like, writing on it, maybe, but this keyboard's sort of not really good enough for that. Um so I don't know. I, I think really it's just for hacking with because to open it up is really easy. There's like 10 screws or something that you have to take out of it. And then you've got access to everything. That screen is so nice. What I would love to see is a way to connect something else to that screen, basically. <laughs> or like you could probably take the guts out of it and put in um, like guts from a NUC or something. I'm sure a competent hardware hacker could easily make it into... A really nice laptop somehow um and strangely it's got this mini hdmi out which is the same port as on the raspberry pi zero but it just didn't seem to work at all so i don't know if that was software or hardware or what but i tried my cable with a raspberry pi zero it worked fine same monitor same everything just nothing came up on the screen in software just didn't detect the the monitor so fuck knows what's going on there but well, that kind of sucked. It sounds like there might be the same kind of codec hardware decoding section on the um, on the chip that maybe hasn't been unlocked with the OS. Yeah, I've have heard that, but I don't know whether that's true. Yeah. So it would be good if you could do that, and if you could get flawless media playback on it, then suddenly it would be yeah. a great device. You know, it's basically a tablet with a keyboard and touchpad, and no touchscreen. So. Yeah, that's the other, it's not a touchscreen, which would be nice, but for 140 quid, what do you want? You know, if it's a, I'd rather have a really good screen that isn't a touchscreen than a shitty touchscreen, if you know what I mean. So at this point, you pipe up about how great Risk Five is going to be because you know it doesn't have all these 
weird features and various different versions, even of the same similar processor? Well, yeah, it'd be good if it was a proper open instruction set that would perform well. But I think that's still quite a way away, isn't it, before we're going to get anything near this price for it. I, I didn't want to moan about it. I wanted to come on and say it was amazing, but just my experience has not been very good. I don't know if that's because the 1080p screen meant that they had to kind of scramble at the last minute to, with the software or, or what, but just the KDE Neon experience on it is not great. Like, for example, you first boot it up, and before you do the um, like the OEM install thing, setting your password and everything, the mouse is really slow to move across the screen. You have to then go, you know, it's like you have to do several strokes of the touchpad to get it down into the corner to the menu before you can go and move the um, acceleration up to 2.5 or whatever, and then suddenly it's usable again. Just little touches like that mean that it felt a bit rushed to me. And this weird bug that I've got now where the windows disappear until you mouse over them, and then like only sections of them appear and stuff, that's just a lack of QA, isn't it, at the end of the day? I think with the the other non-1080p version of it, I think they had quite a lot of time to refine the software experience on it, whereas now it's just too early. I think that this is not a machine to be using now. This is a machine to be owning in the future when more software becomes available for it, people work out how to get hardware acceleration working, um, people have cool hardware hacks and stuff. It, it's It's something that's going to sit on the shelf and be periodically played with, I think, as new stuff comes out, rather than something that I'm going to use every day. You just need to travel more. What, leave the house? No, thank you very much. <laughs> Having a quick look on the Raspberry Pi site, there is the Pi Top, and just as a comparison, so it's a similar type of thing. Obviously, if you get a Pi 3 in there, you're talking about 300 uh, British pounds for that, which is at least twice as much. So, I mean, they're not the same thing. The Pi Tops are hacking. You slide it open. You can add extra features in there. But if you are using one in this type of manner, you're talking about at least half the price. I mean, it, it isn't bad if you're just going to use it for that. And I don't know. I could actually see this as being a very handy tool for, for working if they could get a kernel that's up to date and getting secure patches on it, though. Well, as I said, that AOSC ROM for it, had a much more up-to-date kernel, so it must be possible. It'd be good if they could get a mainline kernel for it and just have proper updates that way. Yeah. And, you know, you'd be able to upgrade to the next version of KDE Neon when that comes out. I don't know. It, it just remains to be seen, really. Or you can get Arch with XFCE, and I tried that thinking, yeah, I can handle a pre-configured Arch with XFCE, but unfortunately, that would not log in. You get to the login screen put in the password and then it just won't start X properly for some reason. I tried even running it as root and stuff and just nothing. I think that was because it must have been configured for the um, 720p screen, which is a shame. But again, that feels like the kind of thing that's going to get fixed in new versions. And I'm really hoping that this will turn out to be much better than it is right now because I kind of said to myself that I'll get it. If it's shit, then I'll just sell it. And um, probably not lose too much in it because people want to get a hold of them. And there were actually offers in our Telegram group for people who wanted to buy it already. <laughs> so I'm sure I could sell it. But I think that I want to hang on to it just to see what develops yeah. with it because it it seems to be the kind of uh, like a cool Raspberry Pi type device that you know software and hardware hackers will be playing with over the next months and years. So I'm glad I've got it now. But I, I was a bit disappointed with it to start with I'm afraid watch this space yeah pretty much well I'll keep everyone up to date on it if there's kind of developments there and if things start to be a bit better on it or whatever but I suppose with that we'd better get it wrapped up so we'll be back in a couple of weeks hopefully with a full house again but until then I've been Joe I've been Phelan and I've been Graham see you later